ただいまよりイノベーティブシティフォーラム。We'd like to start the urban development session of the Innovative City Forum. The theme is Envisioning Global Cities 2025 New Definitions of Prosperity and Livability. Let us introduce、uh, the speakers、uh, who will be at this、uh, session. Professor of Urban Design at the Bartlett School of Architecture, University College London, Professor Peter Bishop. From、uh, Columbia University, Holiday Professor and Director, Center for the Urban Real Estate,、uh, Professor Vishan Chakrabati. Architect and urban planner, founder of Dominique Perrault Architecture, professor at EPFL, member of the Grand Paris Scientific Council, Dr. Dominique Perrault. And as moderator, we have、uh, Professor Hiro Ichikawa, Dean and Professor, Professional Graduate School of Government Studies, Meiji University. So、uh, we hand over the floor to you, Professor Ichikawa. Thank you for the kind introduction. Now, at last we are coming to the session Envisioning Global Cities 2025 New Definitions of Prosperity and Livability. For two hours, we will have four panelists to discuss on this theme. I will introduce four cities. Right now, what is happening in London? London growing and growing even after 2012 Olympics. And the Olympic Park, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in the eastern part, is also growing. And c i t y as well as Nine Elms, there are large scale mixed use developments going on. In King's Cross, a large scale development has just started. In Royal Dock, there are new developments being planned. Centering on London City Airport. So, so much for London. Turning to New York. In New York, there are large scale projects ongoing in the inner city. This is Hudson Yards, the United States' largest private sector property project. The World Trade Center, the construction is still ongoing. Essex Crossing. Here there are plans in the pipeline. And on Long Island at Hunters Point South, large scale development projects are being planned. In Williamsburg, where the factories have vacated, there's a plan for large scale redevelopment in 2024 to be the completion year. So, so much for New York. Moving to Paris. But、Paris is being a vision to be revitalized for the inner city through the Grand Paris、uh, program.、Uh, this is Ivry Confluence, where the two rivers, the Seine and the Mall, not the Meads, this is to be redeveloped. And you see the National Library being designed uh, uh, by uh, Mr. Dominic Perrault、uh, on the left bank of、uh, the Seine.、Uh, the redevelopment、uh, is ongoing. And at l e z a r d Uh, the offices as well as research centers、uh, are, are being planned to be built at La Defense and at Clichy b a t i g n o l Also, large scale mixed use development is being planned at Paris n o l d e t In the southern part of La Plan Saint, Saint Denis,、uh, also a revitalization project、uh, is being planned. And Tokyo is also about to change dramatically. 
The, Han the Haneda International Airport, further internationalization of the airport is being planned. Now, nearest to this venue, the new Yamanote Line station between Shinagawa and Tamachi is being envisioned. At Toyosu Harumi area, this is where one of the main stadiums for the 2020 Olympics and Paralympic Games are being planned to be built. In Marunouchi, Otemachi, Nihonbashi area, there are indeed a very active uh, development uh, projects ongoing. And in Shibuya, there are many plans are going ahead for high rises and mixed use development. For Roppongi and Tranomon area, with a ring road number two at the center, it will be changed dramatically. As we move towards 2025, every city is now going through a big change. Now, what I would like to present to you is what may be the future for these four cities. And I will be responsible for Tokyo as a kickoff. So let me present to you how I will be giving you presentation. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, the present Tokyo, the present time Tokyo. You see the word Tokyo. First of all, I would like to make analysis of the Tokyo. Let me explain to you the ranking. Uh, the from had one o'clock uh, this afternoon. For this year, the ranking of Tokyo was the fourth of four for the Global Power City Index. And you also have Global Power Inner City Index and Global Power Metropolitan Area Index. So this will be the current status of Tokyo. And in the year 2020, there will be Tokyo Olympics. And uh, then in 2025, what will happen to the cities? Tokyo and also London, New York and Paris will be compared. First of all, starting with the Global Power City Index, the ranking of the cities, 40 cities that were analyzed. And the salient feature is looking at the comprehensive power as a magnetic force uh, being not just a financial center or business center. There are other elements uh, being uh, observed. The city has been divided into six functions, economy, research and development, cultural interaction, livability, environment, and accessibility. Six functions, major functions, are being observed through 70 indicators. And this is the feature of uh, the GPCI. To give you the conclusion first, the top four cities, namely London, New York, Paris, and Tokyo, as you can see, are ranked here. And following this group, you have the major cities in Asia and Europe in the best 10 ranking. There are some characteristics in London. The, uh, the cultural interaction is the strongest. And uh, the accessibility on the right-hand side, London is the top for New York, R&D. New York is number one. And what about Paris? Livability comes first. For Tokyo, it is economy. So top four cities have uh, different functions uh, being uh, focused on. But Tokyo is still number four right now. Apart from the GPCI, what about the inner city? This is for the 2010 version. And at the end of the year, we will have 2014 ranking. And for the major cities, not 40, but as you can see, the cities on the map, the inner city is being analyzed. But when you say inner city, there are different ranges, of five kilometer and 10 kilometer radiuses. And how you look at this, there are six properties. As you can see, the background information, vital property, cultural property, luxury property, amenity property, interactive property, and mobility property. The six properties are being used. And to give you the conclusion, this will be the results. For the five kilometer radius, according to the GPCI, the London was the top and New York was the second. But in terms of inner city ranking, top is Paris, the second is Tokyo, and third is Hong Kong. So in five kilometers radius from the center of the city. And as you can see with these mapping, there are different combinations. Everything is being concentrated. 
So looking at the power of uh, the city, the five kilometer radius from the inner city uh, is uh, the quite uh, powerful indicator, but uh, perhaps 10 kilometer radius, uh, the f number one is Paris, the second is uh, to Tokyo, and it is much more clearer when you look at the 10 kilometers radius. By far, it is Paris and Tokyo. You can see that the cities are very different if you focus on inner cities. Now, you have now focused on inner cities. What next? You need to look at the metropolitan area. This is what we call GPMAI, Global Power Metropolitan Area Index, is what we have uh, developed. For this, we have selected 10 major cities of the world. Los Angeles is included here, and Amsterdam is also included. And the color indicates the density of population, where it is dense. In Tokyo, you can see that there are 35 million population, so the red area is uh, quite well spread out, and Paris is much more concentrated, as you can see. So the difference between uh, the, the GPCI and the, the GPMII, the metropolis is much larger. So what do we do? The method we have employed is five functions and three states of dynamism are being used. Dynamism meaning stock, flow, and growth. Looking at uh, the dynamic movement development, looking at vitality, intelligence, interaction, network, and sustainability. So five functions and three states are being created into matrix. To give you the result, what is the strength of Tokyo? Intelligence, as you can see. And furthermore, sustainability, Tokyo is quite good, but you can see that there are similarities. But Tokyo is more like intelligence and network is uh, quite uh, the good compared to the other cities. When you look at dy dy dynamism analysis, for Tokyo, the stock is very huge because uh, this is the biggest metropolitan area in the industrialized world. But in looking at flow, of course, uh, we are behind London and New York, especially. And looking at the growth, growth potential, this is the weak point, weakness for Tokyo. And as you can see with this dynamism data, Tokyo is not topped. Tokyo is uh, in the middle. So to try to summarize, for GPCI and GPICI, and GPMAI, we have looked at the cities from the three indicators, and we will be able to see the difference and see the characteristics of the cities. And there is a, a the weakness uh, the for the, uh, the cultural interaction for GPCI, and Tokyo, in terms of inner city density, it is quite good. The stock. Looking at the GPMI, Tokyo is quite good, but flow and growth, the dynamism may not be that good dynamic. You may have taken these things for taken granted, but if you make these analysis, you'll be able to see clearly what is different and what is weak and what is strong. Now, in 2020, there will be Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics Games. What will happen? I will be jumping forward, but when you think of things, looking at Tokyo and looking at Japan, what is, what is the demographic trend? We should not forget the demographics. Taking from 2005 to 2050, so 10 years ago, the starting point, and what will happen up until 2050? In 2050, the population, total population will be less than 90 million, and that is being predicted. And of course, the challenge is what to do with it. But uh, the question is, at the, around 2035, this is the demographic pyramid for Japan, uh, the senior citizens, 65 or over age, will be double in size compared to the younger generation. From 2030 to 2045, you can see that uh, there will be much difficulty for Japan. And to give you the answer then, by 2030, we should do our utmost, uh, try uh, to enhance our strengths. And then uh, the senior citizens will go away 
after 2045. So until then, how can we survive? So until 2035, what should we do is something we need to think about, firstly. Then there is a, a fact that we need to know. Of course, there is a declining population on a nationwide basis, but where we see the strengths being concentrated, Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, and also uh, the uh, the Seto Inland Sea in Fukuoka, and this is set the Western Japan axis. And right here, 70% of the Japanese population are concentrated here. But what I have given you as a concern, at around 2040, 80% of the population will be actually concentrated here. And at the, right at the center is Tokyo. From Tokyo to Fukuoka, the Western axis, and if you do not do well, then the whole of Japan will collapse. And you will be able to know what is the special role to be played by Tokyo. And what could happen to Tokyo itself, the demographic change? The data given is from 1998. There has been three estimates of forecast, and they were all wrong because they were looking from the basis of the past trends. Right now, it is 12.5 uh, million, it is more than 30 million. So even though on a nationwide basis, population is declining, but in Tokyo, population is still increasing. Now, for Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics Games in 2020, what will happen? I'm sure you are much interested to know. But as a zoning, you have a heritage zone. Uh, this was where the to 1964 Tokyo Olympics was zone. And uh, this time it will Tokyo Bay zone, and there will be new Olympic Stadium to be built. Uh, now, well, the original design has now been demolished, and now we will be uh, building a new stadium. It will be mostly in the Tokyo Bay zone. About two thirds of the stadium will be concentrated in Tokyo Bay zone, in the coastal zone, the waterfront. So there will be much impact seen there. Now, there's one thing. I need to mention here. 1964 Tokyo Olympics, uh, they have uh, created a lot of uh, highways and infrastructure, especially uh, the Metropolitan Expressway was built. What will happen this time? The Narita and Haneda airports that have uh, been uh, added together, looking at uh, what may be in the future, the number of aircraft movements. If you go to 1.1 million flights, then the New York, right now it is 1.18, and London, 1.10 million flights. So in 2020, we need to develop uh, up until here, and the government is thinking about this. What uh, should be done? The answer is very simple. For Haredda and Narita airports, how to actually utilize them? You need uh, to utilize Haneda Airport to full capacity. Even though the Olympic Games will be in 2020, then you may need to add uh, a new runway afterwards. This is the Haneda Airport uh, that today. There are four runways. If you are to add a runway, uh, the aircrafts are not allowed on the inner city airspace. But if you are to add a runway, you have to allow airplanes to fly over the inner city and also so if you are to have the fifth runway right here, airplanes must fly over the middle of uh, Tokyo. Of course, uh, you can theoretically uh, try to increase uh, the number of aircraft movements, which means that what is not done right now must be allowed to be done. Now, what about Shinkansen bullet train between Tokyo and Nagoya? It will be connected on a, a straight line with a linear uh, Shinkansen. Uh, the biggest point, right now, the current uh, Shinkansen is on the coastal line. And in 2027, about 50 million metropolitan area at the will of the be uh, born with Tokyo and Nagoya are being added together, meaning that there's a lot of impact on Tokyo, a uh, big change for Tokyo. Then what would happen for Tokyo going forward from 2014 to 2025 for uh, 10 years? and several locations will be changing dramatically. First of all, Marunochi Otemachi Nihonbashi area. In Japanese, what we call the chain redevelopment has been done. So uh, almost every day, uh, the 
uh, renovation and rebuilding, uh, dismantling are happening. Tokyo Station was renovated, and right in front of Tokyo Station, it will be expanded, and a square will be built, and the shrine will be revived in Nihonbashi, that all the Yedo city will be regenerated in trying to redesign the whole area. And in Toranomon area and Roppongi area, and today we are at the Roppongi Hills, but in the surrounding areas there will be new high-rises to be built in the coming decade. And for example, right in the back of this building there will be bus terminals and new subway stations to be built. And Shibuya, there are all sorts of plans and buildings will be built. And in 10 years from time, all these high rises have already been completed. And lastly, right now where there is no building, in Shinagawa Station, uh, this is the, the uh, stockyard for rolling stocks. And uh, combining with uh, the Bay Area, the redevelopment uh, the will uh, be done. This will be the new station being planned to be built. So this will be the new station, and they're trying uh, to uh, revive uh, the, the whole district itself. And to what will be feasible? I have given you some statistics, how many office buildings and so forth. This could be the first percentage. Then looking at the Tokyo as a whole, you can see it will be moving to the circular me megalopolis the structure, the center core, and the waterfront. In 2001, uh, this uh, is a plan being envisaged. In 2009, this has been revised. And Tokyo is dramatically changing with the plan being put in place. And this is the inner city. The inner city is being revived, and this is uh, true for New York, uh, uh, Paris, as well as London. So these cities will be turned into these kind of districts. This is what we keenly feel. Tokyo is changing every day, and the people living in the city is changing every day. We will be listening to the three speakers and how the cities will be changing. We will have Professor Peter Bishop uh, to explain to us on London. And then we will have Professor Vishan Chakrabarti to talk about the New York. And lastly, but not least, we will have uh, uh, Mr. Dominic Perrault or to speak about Paris. So this is a star-studded lineup, if I may say so. I'm sure you are much interested to listen to them. Thank you. Now, following uh, my presentation, the first uh, speaker will talk about London. Professor Bishop, please. So over to you, Professor Bishop. Uh, come to Tokyo and address your conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about London, uh, and I'm going to talk I'm sorry, you've, you've loaded the wrong presentation up. So you apologize. Uh, the wrong presentation is here. Uh, this one takes about an hour and a half, which is a bit too long. So if you excuse me, we'll just reload. Uh, right. Uh, thank you for your patience. That's the nightmare uh, introduction to any any talk. Anyway, I'm going to talk about London. Uh, I'm going to talk about intensification. Uh, and intensification is probably the one word that sums up the policies guiding London at the moment. Uh, London is a global city. Uh, it's ambitious. It's growing. 
And we made a decision quite a long time ago that London wasn't going to continue outwards, it wasn't going to sprawl into the countryside, and therefore it had to basically recycle land, recycle infrastructure, and get bigger and get denser and become more intense. I'm going to talk about four projects which I've been involved in, uh, the London Olympics, and on the back of that, how we try to push the energy out to the uh, other areas of East London. I'm going to talk about intensification on the central London sites, focusing on King's Cross. Uh, and finally, I'm going to look at micro-projects, all the other small things you need to do to make life better in a denser and intensified city. But this is the, the basic map of London, uh, where the developable land, the opportunity, is in the east, where we had the old industry and the docklands. Uh, we have had some successes. This is uh, the Canary Wharf development, now London's second business district, its financial centre. Uh, 30 years ago, this was disused, derelict dockland. Uh, but when you move further east, you have this kind of condition. Uh, we have an awful lot of land. We have low density. We have uh, contaminated land. Uh, we have old infrastructure. And the whole reason for bidding for the Olympics for 2012 was to use the Olympics as a catalyst to try and pull investment and pull interest into this very, very difficult area of the city to develop. We also said that London was going to be the most sustainable games. Uh, the Olympics, by definition, is not a sustainable event. But there are two things which underpinned the London bid. Uh, the first was we, we focused it in possibly the poorest and most deprived parts of the city because we wanted it to be a catalyst to change those conditions, change the uh, opportunities of people living in that area for the better, and to revitalize East London. And secondly, we deliberately chose brownfield land, uh, land which had had previous development on it, to change it, to bring it back into use, but to also use the infrastructure and the capacity that we had. Uh, part of this strategy was to make a very, very compact Olympics. This is the same scale of London compared with Beijing. So a compact campus in East London with other facilities spread widely across the rest of London as a capital. Uh, and here, uh, I've got the pointer here, uh, here on the right, uh, the red area is the area of the Olympics. The grey area is central London. Uh, and by chance, we had a, a juxtaposition in East London of deprivation, contaminated land, opportunity, but also very significant public transport capacity. And it meant that the London Olympics did not have to spend large amounts of money and have a long lead-in period to provide transport infrastructure, which would have been extremely costly and would have taken us a long time on the program. Uh, this is the area, uh, and very, very typical of the conditions in East London, uh, areas of old industry, uh, very, very poorly functioning industry, and uh, highly contaminated land. We had to assemble the land. We had to assemble nearly 90 hectares of land. We relocated every business to new premises. We didn't extinguish a single business. So we cleared the land, and over the course of the land, uh, we had to deal with this, very, very typical conditions. It was a part of London that we used to dump our rubbish. So over the site, we had to dig out roughly four meters of topsoil, cleanse it and recycle it and reuse it. Uh, we had to do a huge cleanup uh, and decontamination of the site to prepare it for, as a development platform. Uh, and then we had to build a completely new physical topography, a new landform, uh, and a completely new set of infrastructures around power, around water, around drainage, before we could even start. And as you know, in Tokyo, a period of six years between winning a bid and opening the games is a very, very challenging time period for any city. Uh, we had three master plans for the Olympics. This is the first one. Uh, this was prepared by Allies of Morrison, the firm which I worked for. Uh, and this is the master plan that guided 
the development of the Olympics as a games venue. Uh, it had a series of stadia. This is the uh, athletic stadium. It's not as beautiful as the one you'll build in Tokyo. It's not as beautiful as Beijing, but this contains 10% of the structure of the steel in the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing. So a lot of our strategy was around being very, very careful on our design and on the sustainability of our design practices. Uh, secondly, every stadium had a plan to reuse it. Um, as a nation, we didn't need an 80,000-seater athletic stadium, so the stadium is capable of being dismantled and reduced to being a 25,000-seater stadium. Every Olympic venue has a plan for its dismantling, movement, or reuse as part of a long-term sustainable strategy. Uh, and the Games opened, and uh, I hope you enjoyed them. We certainly enjoyed them in London. I hope you enjoy your Games in Tokyo. It is a great event for a city to host. We then had a second master plan, and this is the transition master plan, which we've just completed. We deliberately closed down the entire park for two years while we adapted and dismantled and prepared a long-term development platform. And then we had a third master plan, uh, which, again, Allies of Morrison are the master planners for. Uh, and this tries to tackle this really difficult problem for a city. Uh, you build an Olympic Games as a secure specialist games campus, but you don't want it after the Games. What you want is to explode it to become an organic piece of city for urban growth to happen. And this was the kind of our starting point in addressing the questions of legacy. Uh, we looked at other cities. Uh, we didn't think Atlanta had legacy sorted. We didn't think Athens had done it very, very well. And we thought there are lessons here. Uh, we did think Barcelona had done it well. And we thought there are lessons about thinking, about embedding the planning for the legacy in the planning for the games. We worked on six very, very simple spatial strategies. The first was to retain elements of the games as a memory, uh, which could actually form a structure for future planning. The second was to deliberately construct a set of neighborhoods reflecting the settlement patterns of London. The third was to improve connectivity and build a structure of roads and streets, again, very much on the basis of London's structure. The fourth was to use open space, the fifth water, and the sixth was to aspire to producing a very complex piece of city, which would have built in its planning its ability to adapt and change over time. Uh, we worked on, uh, we're working on this at the moment, but the first uh, legacy projects are now emerging deliberately designed on a relatively low scale. Uh, we're very interested in sort of six to eight stories rather than 30 to 40 stories. We think that is a legacy which suits the area and will form a very sustainable neighborhood where families uh, will come and live, uh, children will grow up, and people can work in a very, very high quality environment. Uh, and this is the sort of final uh, legacy master plan. Uh, this will take us through the next 15 years of development. And I suppose the objective is to produce a piece of city that blends uh, seamlessly with its surroundings, but also to produce a, a piece of city that tackles the social and the economic deprivation of its area and gives the opportunities for people to change their lives as a result of the Olympics Games. And that's the objective for the Olympics, and that's why we bid for it. We also want to use it as a catalyst for change. And this is the area... Uh, quite close to the Olympics. Uh, the Olympics is here in London, and this is the Royal Docks area. A huge opportunity, quite close to the Central Business District and to Canary Wharf. But for some reason, development and the property market had always ignored this. Uh, and we started working on this about three years ago. Uh, and the first thing we observed was we counted 73 master plans in the last 40 years for this piece of London. So the move was to just scrap them. Uh, master plans without the ability to implement do not achieve change. Uh, what we produced instead was a very slim document, which is a narrative, 
This was a story. This was a story about what this piece of London could be. And critically, we got all the politicians from different parties to sign it and to sign up for it. So we achieved a political consensus and we achieved a simple story. Uh, the idea was to try and focus development around the emerging environmental industries. We called it a green enterprise district. Uh, this is a branding exercise, uh, and I make no apology for that. But it's to try and tell a story that people might respond to and see it in a positive light in terms of development. Uh, because we had a story, we could bring the main landowners together and get them involved in a grand alliance to try and realize change. We could then start to agree a common vision, and we could then start to produce master plans that were rooted in a political reality, which was sea change which had eluded us here for the last 30 years. And on the back of this, uh, people like Siemens have moved in with their headquarters for environmental research. Uh, we've constructed a new cable car to link across the Thames. Uh, and now this is a scheme uh, which has just received consent and will be starting later this year, a major new business park uh, with a Chinese investor looking almost as the kind of the, the toehold in the European market for Chinese firms wishing to expand. Uh, so that's just the story of the Olympics. Uh, elsewhere in London, uh, intensification means more or less the same, but on a far tighter, smaller scale. Uh, the London Plan identifies a whole series of small areas where we think we can focus change and get the economic growth without expanding the city outwards. Uh, the London Plan also has a clear relationship that growth can happen in areas of high public transport accessibility. This is the transport accessibility map for London, and it basically focuses growth in areas where we don't have to invest in costly transport systems, but where we have capacity. Uh, and to increase capacity, uh, we are now constructing uh, a new major metro system to link Heathrow Airport with the city into the east to unlock the development potential and redraw the map of London and allow development to happen in a focused and a concentrated manner. Uh, and one of the sites uh, which has already been picked up is Battersea Nine Elms. Uh, this is very typical of one of our intensification sites, a mixture of high rise, medium rise, and low rise, exploiting a plan along the banks of the river. Uh, and in this case, uh, the prerequisite is that the developers will be funding a new metro link to sort out the public transport accessibility in this part of London. Uh, this is the second site. Uh, this is the King's Cross site. Uh, to orientate you, this is central London. This is Buckingham Palace and Parliament. So King's Cross is a kind of critical site, a huge opportunity in central London, but again, in development terms, has always been seen on the periphery of what would be attractive. Uh, a major site between two stations, this is the high-speed rail link through to continental Europe, to Paris, Brussels, and next year through to Germany. And the site here uh, was unlocked by the construction of the high-speed rail links. Uh, we started looking at this, and this might well sound counterintuitive for a city interested in intensification. Uh, King's Cross uh, set out to become another piece of London, to be of a human scale. Uh, deliberately, we studied parts of our city. We decided that sort of 8, 10, 12 stories was about the right kind of scale to make a very, very good and very, very valuable piece of real estate in London. Uh, we produced uh, the master plan, uh, and the critical thing about the master plan here between the two railways was to come up with an urban form which reconciled the areas either side uh, but which deliberately retained the historic fabric. Very important historic fabric, uh, 19th century uh, railways, uh, granaries, warehouses. Uh, and the developer was very, very keen to retain these. And the master plan was deliberately drawn up to try and make sense of them within a new piece of city. 
Uh, and uh, the scheme is now half built. And interestingly enough, for what is medium density, low rise, inner city commercial development, a mix of housing, residential, uh, anchored by a new university. Uh, because the work was done in the master plan to create a place very early on in the development process, uh, what has happened is the headline rents are 80% higher than anticipated five years ago when construction started. So commercially, it's being hugely successful. Uh, and strangely, it's also publicly very, very popular and is seen as probably one of the key developments in redefining uh, how we strike the balance between commercial development and residential areas, and critically, how we integrate new development socially and economically with the surrounding areas and spread the benefits to some of the more deprived communities. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to look at micro-projects. Uh, for a number of years, I ran Design for London, which was the Mayor of London's architectural studio. We became very interested in small-scale interventions, how we could do very, very simple, small-scale things to try and change areas. We became interested in incremental urbanism and temporary urbanism. We became interested in how you could sort of take a piece of city apart, a bit like a watch in the days when you could take watches apart, and then how you could put them back together again and try and make them work better. We became very interested in a methodology where we worked with valuing what's there, work within what was possible, uh, and try to define and do the small things that were missing to put a neighborhood on a different tack towards improvement. Most of our work uh, was done through design charrettes, uh, design charrettes with local people. We moved our design teams out into the neighborhoods where we worked. Uh, and we spent three or four weeks working, arguing, discussing, drawing, to try and actually produce schemes which emerge from the communities they were supposed to serve. Uh, we recognize that in an intensifying, densification uh, a strategy for a city, uh, housing had to be of a high standard. So we produced a new policy framework to make sure we've got high quality standards in housing. Uh, not just floor space standards, we looked at uh, aspect, we looked at floor to ceiling heights, we looked at design qualities to produce good quality housing. And then we produced a whole series of strategies around public space and public realm, which the mayor adopted. We looked at transforming streets, taking some of the cars out. This is Kensington by the Great Museums, uh, which has just been transformed into a shared surface. Uh, elsewhere, we moved into some of the kind of uh, more deprived areas and created space out of places like this, transforming them into new civic spaces. Uh, we looked at temporary interventions around play and activity, which could make a very, very significant change in the way people saw their neighborhoods. Uh, and we worked with people to do a whole series of temporary installations. This was a, a student project uh, which ran one summer producing a bar uh, about 7,000 US dollars for the entire project. It ran for the summer. It used the top of an old car park. Uh, and then finally, uh, we became more and more interested in how, as designers, you curate the city, how you choreograph space. We recognize that design doesn't stop when you complete the drawings. It doesn't stop when the contractor leaves site. And increasingly, we moved back and we worked very, very intensively with communities around how spaces could work. In this case, just putting soft play area into a public space to increase the usage. Uh, and to finish, uh, I was very intrigued by the first uh, poll that we did this morning, when there was a predominance of support for the idea of strong leadership and strong government. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with that. But I think one thing I would stress is whatever you do, there has to be room. Cities have to make space for the unexpected. They have to make space for people to do things like this in a way the city planning can never do. And that is probably the message I want to leave you with. Thank you very much.
Bishop, sensei, ありがとうございます。Thank you very much,、uh, Professor Bishop. So, we talked about intensification. So, we're using the word compact as well for our Olympics. There's a lot to learn from the、uh, London Olympics case. And in many ways,、uh, we need to、uh, pursue uh, urban uh, intensification. So, in many ways, There was a lot to learn.、Uh, following up on London, let's hear about New York. We have、uh, Professor Vishan Chakrabarti. So he's going to talk about the future of New York. Please. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Shikawa.、Uh, it's a pleasure to be here.、Uh, so,、uh, normally I give a lecture very similar to the one that Peter just gave about the intensification of New York. And I wrote a book a couple of years ago about urban policy and lectured quite a bit on that book. But what I found is that when you lecture about things like intensification, which I very much believe in, I very much believe that cities are really a global salvation and can help us in terms of prosperity, in terms of、uh, sustainability, in terms of social change. But what I find is that people, especially in our dense cities today, feel overwhelmed. They feel overwhelmed by the complexity of the times in which we live. And what I mean by that is the world has always been a complex place. But today, because of especially technology, We have a view into the complexity of the world and the world beyond us in a way that we never have before. So, this, for instance, is、uh, the best known image we have of the universe compiled in 2012,、and、it gives a staggering idea of how expansive our universe is. This is an image of only three minutes of Twitter downloads、uh, in cities across the world. Uh, this is actually an image of the internet, and what it is representing are server connections across the world, and the colors represent different、uh, continents. So, in other words,、uh, the red is Asia, the green is Europe, the blue is the Americas, and one of the things that I find very interesting about this image is the white are the unknown. And this is the Human Genome Project, talk about the unknown. Uh, where we can actually map one of the most complex things that we know, our own biology. And then, as we've moved past the Cold War order and understand the extraordinary complexity of our times, this is a map of ISIS mo movements、uh, throughout Iraq and trying to understand the absolute bewilderment of the times we live in. Uh, and that all of that impacts the way we think about our cities. And、uh, as I said, I believe very much in density intensification. This is an image of Kowloon Walled City, the most、uh, dense environment ever created by humankind.、Uh, most of us don't live at that kind of density. The seven billion of us live、uh, in quite a scattered array across the planet in terms of how we use land.、Uh, and in my book, I talk about the fact that. If all seven billion of us lived not at skyscraper density, but actually only about sort of three or four story brownstone density, about 75 units to the hectare,、uh, that all seven billion of us could fit in the state of Texas、uh, in the United States. Now, I'm stating that not to suggest that we all move to Texas、uh, and that we leave the rest of the world for agriculture and nature, but to actually say that. How we live in terms of density, I think, will actually dictate the future of the world.、Uh, and if we can live in a more dense way, we will certainly、uh, lower our carbon impact and create a better planet. But what I found in talking to people about that is that density or intensification, depending on how you talk about it, has a namelessness and a facelessness that scares people. And I think one of our obligations as designers. Is to understand this is an image of the human fingerprint. Understand how the human imprint can make itself known、uh, in terms of the dense world in which we are moving into that Professor Ichikawa described across our cities, across our world.、Uh, and as architects, we spent much of the 20th century struggling and debating over issues of style, became lost in that world. Uh, and really, I think, lost our way in terms of understanding the true beauty, and I will sort of use this very dangerous word, beauty, 
to talk about how beauty could actually, in the 21st and 22nd century, be a way in which people can embrace the complexity of the world, not deny it, not be reductive about it, but actually find a lens into it. Um, and I feel that in order to do that, that we no longer need Superman. It is not about the architect as superhero, but in fact, we need the Avengers. We need an extraordinary group of skills, men, women, people of all different uh, orientations and races and skills to try to give us that beauty, to give us that lens into the complexity. And in fact, it may not be about four or five Avengers, but in fact, an entire world of different skill sets where it's not just about architects and engineers and bureaucrats, but the biologist and the chef and the poet. Uh, and this is, these are images from our studio, and this is very much what we try to build, where not everyone is an architect, and people come from very, very diverse backgrounds and mindsets, all towards this idea of building a better city, of building a city that's inclusive, that's green, uh, that's dense, that's transit-based, that's culturally based. Uh, and we don't have these cities in the world. It is an asymptote. It is something towards which we are all moving. And I think there are many lessons to learn, especially from here in Japan. This is an image of a farming village outside of Narita. And instantly you see the sort of grace and social beauty of the farmers living together, farming the fields outside of their village. And you understand how sustainable an environment like this, dense as it is, even though it's a fairly small scale environment relative to the big cities that we're talking about here today. So I believe from this you can extrapolate lessons. Uh, lessons that we should not live out in this horizontal sprawl and try to use technology and windmills and solar panels to try to fix that very 20th century model on the left, but in fact use our cities to uh, not only build densely, but to leave nature natural, to be able to access na nature in a much more direct way directly outside of our cities, uh, connected largely by train. At the same time, we understand that the hub and spoke model of our cities is actually changing. This idea that people live outside of our cities and commute into a central business district every day. This is changing very rapidly, and you saw it in all of the images that Dr. Ichikawa showed about all of these various cities, that we are moving into, especially because of technology, a networked city model, where throughout a big city, you can find an archipelago, a series of islands of places where people live, work, and play across many districts, and I think this is reflective of what London has been doing in terms of Eastern London. So uh, in New York, we have tried to build the Hudson Yards area. Um, this is an extension of uh, the existing subway line, uh, the expansion of the High Line Park, which just opened two weeks ago into its third phase into Hudson Yards. This is under construction. This is some four million square meters of new city that's being developed as a mixed-use place built around a series of parks uh, uh, by uh, the west side of Manhattan. But what you understand is as you try to build cities of that complexity, of that size, and with those kinds of ambitions, that the bureaucracy can be overwhelming and that one needs, again, that interdisciplinary approach to deal with what is a very complex regulatory structure that every single city has today. Uh, we, in many ways, started this kind of work in Lower Manhattan after the events of 9-11 where we had to rediscover our waterfront as a means of bringing more amenity to Lower Manhattan in the aftermath of the tragedy of 9-11. And much of this was discontinuous. It was hard to access. There was a highway between where one needed to uh, get from the city out to the water. And then these are these images, uh, quickly, of the waterfront that we built along Lower Manhattan, including a new pier that's really quite beautiful, very public, not very uh, large in size, fairly low budget, with public space at both levels. And then next to it, an old shopping mall that's also changing and moving away from the old internal idea of shopping where everyone is trapped kind of uh, in, in a place and instead breaking it down and, uh, and again using this beautiful glass shutter system to open up during uh, nice weather. Uh, and always opening and embracing the complexity of the city, uh, not trying to enclose and control the city. Um, this is uh, uh, Essex Crossing or Seward Park, which Professor Ishikawa mentioned, uh, a large housing project including much social housing, a senior housing project uh, connected to the subway 
And this is an initial sketch that, again, talks about how do we bring a set of complexities into the section of the city, also how do we bring light and air into the city and down into the subway and this new market. So this is, being, uh, this is work for the city in terms of that big light scoop bringing light down into the subway level uh, with new food and retail experiences there. Or across the river, the Domino Project. I was very interested in what Professor Ichikawa showed in the terms of the five kilometers and the 10 kilometers. We're really rediscovering the area in that 10 kilometer belt outside of Manhattan. Um, and this is part of a new waterfront uh, for Brooklyn. This was the previously approved plan for this. This is 3 million square feet or 300,000 square meters of new development, all centered on uh, a heritage building, an old factory called the Domino Sugar Plant. Um, and we actually proposed to the city that the buildings go higher to get them out of the floodplain, um, and also to build uh, uh, about 6.6 .6 acres of new parkland along the waterfront and also to aerate the building. So every building in the master plan has an aperture in it to bring light and air. It's not to end the access at La Defense or, or to make a big iconic statement like CCTV, but in fact a very performative function of bringing light and air back to the neighborhood. And we tried very carefully to move and interpret the complexity of the city in terms of the lower scale of this neighborhood, the kind of scale of the bridge and the factory, and then the scale of the skyline. Uh, and so uh, this master plan was approved with taller buildings, but again, a quite glorious park, and the factory in the middle. And what's important about this is this is not just housing. This is housing, an office space, independent retailers, a school, a community center. It's really about building neighborhood. Um, and how these buildings meet the street, critically important in terms of building that neighborhood, with a very heavy emphasis on bicycling and walking, uh, so it's not even about using the subway to reach Manhattan, but again, uh, kind of its own node within the larger uh, network of the city. And a, and a way of identifying the place using the old industrial artifacts, uh, and this again will be a technology hub. We at Columbia did a study that said that um, 85% of our new technology jobs are, are in heritage buildings, are in pre-war buildings, because those people don't actually want to be in tall towers. They want to be in a different kind of work environment. So this is something we're very much trying to build in New York. And we're also trying to emphasize a new skyline in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is uh, sort of the next chapter in New York's history, if you will. We're also starting to understand, well, what does it mean to build a responsible tower? What does it mean to build a tower that's really part of our city? And we've looked to some of the great towers of New York to understand this, that it's not just a building out efficiency, efficiently the program of the tower, but using the structure and then layering on elements that actually give it a, a much greater depth and complexity. And so this is a, a kind of diagram of what we're trying to build in terms of our work with towers this is on 57th Street, a kind of super luxury project next to a heritage site, um, the Steinway Building. Uh, and this shows how we're trying to use the form of this. This is a tower that will be 1,400 feet tall um, and actually will have views through to both the park and the city in terms of its served and servant relationships. Um, with uh, This is an aspect ratio of 1 to 23, so the, the east and west facades are almost all sheer wall with open expanses to the north and to the south. But again, we were very focused on the materiality and understanding what is both great about old New York and new New York, um, and worked with the facade. This is a terracotta facade. It's a built-up facade to create a kind of complexity on the oblique. So when one sees it from the side, you'll see this dance of light and shadow. Um, and you see this terracotta and bronze facade. But this is a historic material used in a 21st century way. Only computers can create these terracotta profiles. Uh, and so you see that this is quite, a, a, quite an elaborate structure that warps and wefts as it moves up uh, the side of the building. But to me, the most important thing is how that new building relates to the mass of the city and grounds it in New York. This is a tower that could not be in Dubai or Shanghai or Mumbai. It is of, by, and for New York City. Uh, with an elaborate top that, again, is meant to be expressive, not just a flat top with light coming through it, with a great responsibility in terms of being worthy of New York's skyline. So if that's a super luxury project, this is Hunter's Point South, 
uh, in Queens. This is a completely affordable housing project. It's 100% social housing, again, with a school and a park near it. Um, this was a city competition. Again, you see a lot of emphasis on bicycling and how people move around this complex. Very difficult in terms of budget and getting architecture to simple things like the use of color, very important. Uh, or in Atlantic Yards, uh, this is one of our great experiments. This is going to be the tallest modular housing project in the world. Uh, it's about 37 stories, so this is prefabricated housing. Again, affordable housing uh, that rises about 37 stories. Uh, uh, this is a structural steel frame and then these modules are built in a nearby factory by union labor. Uh, Overup is the engineer and has the patent on the connections for these modules that are carried by truck to the site. Um, it's still very high quality housing. In fact, I would argue it's better quality and when you're in it, you'll never know you're in a modular housing project. It will feel very normal. Uh, but we believe that these modules, and that's the first module going in place, uh, we'll, which is, again, part of the new economy of New York City, this maker economy of building things right in New York. Um, but uh, this is under construction uh, right now, and we're very excited about it because we believe it can lower construction costs for affordable housing by 20 to 25 percent. This is directly adjacent to the Barclay Center. Uh, this is uh, uh, the project I'm going to sort of leave you with. This is uh, completed. It's a 20,000-seat arena that's uh, first, or the first arena in the United States that has, no, that has no parking associated with it. There's not one single car parking space. It sits on top of 11 subway lines um, that all converge. And the whole idea was to take that standard form of a sports arena, which usually is a black box. It usually closes itself to the city. But instead, it uses this kind of double helix to open itself out to the city, both at the ground level and then in the upper concourses of the building. And then there's this very exuberant moment, this very important moment, where it comes out and meets where the transit connection is in something that we call the Oculus. And so the idea is that when people come through this new subway, and the developer paid about 50 million US dollars for this subway extension, people will come out into this plaza and they will immediately see daylight. Uh, they will also very immediately see the scoreboard because people, of course, if they're late to the game, they want to understand, you know, what's the score? Uh, and so we very much tried to concentrate everything on the arena floor itself. Everything is very muted inside of the arena because we decided that we would think about sports as theater, a kind of theater where you don't know what the ending is going to be. Uh, and so this, again, creates this sense of civic joy, of shared uh, delight in the kind of complexity of the times we live in. Um, and so this is a Beyonce concert. This is the opening night with Jay-Z. Uh, and then talk about exuberance, this is Cher. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the expression of this building, we very much care about that kind of exuberance. And again, look to the materials of Brooklyn. Um, but in a very 21st century way. The building is made of core 10 steel. Uh, this is only possible because of the computer. Um, and so we modeled this in a program called CATIA, which is the same kind of software that's used to design aircraft uh, and, and uh, vehicles. Uh, this is the core 10 being treated uh, for rust protection. And this is actually the way this was fabricated. So it is designed on the computer, and it goes directly to the metal fabricator. There's no, there's no middleman in between. And this is why this building, which actually had quite a low budget for this kind of building, was able to have this kind of exuberance. We actually designed a software program so that you could track every single piece of the Corten steel as it arrived on the site. And so this is 12,000 different curved panels in this rain screen uh, that came by truck, uh, sat on these mega panels and was constructed into a skin that is very much the color of downtown Brooklyn. But then at night becomes something very different and becomes quite, uh, quite uh, luminous. But to me, what's important about this kind of city building is that it is part of the city and integrates into the city in terms of new and old, high and low, uh, and that this is something that's very important if we're going to talk about intensification, that people need to feel the texture uh, and the kind of uh, uh, delight 
of a place like this. And this is the plaza, this is the last slide of my presentation. And I always end with this because to me, this is about how a building in a city becomes more than itself. Um, that its plaza, how it relates to mass transit, how it relates to the neighborhoods around it, creates a sense of civic delight. And perhaps in the complexity of our times, gives us a window in terms of how we think about the world in which we live. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chakrabarti. What will happen to New York going forward? At the outset, just like Professor Bishop, intensification was mentioned and also uh, density was added. So intensifying may be the key word for these big cities. And there were unique features. How could uh, the new construction uh, the will be aligning with uh, the existing skyline? And there were many very important uh, suggestions being made. Now, following the presentation, I would like uh, to invite the Professor Dominic Perrault, and he will be speaking on Paris. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the Bori Foundation about the, this uh, very interesting colloquium. And uh, um, I would like to, to come with my uh, stone. Today, my stone is, is very small. But maybe, I think, I hope, this uh, stone becomes very efficient. A lot of speakers and uh, a lot of people develop some huge strategy. I think it's a, it's a very good way about some huge territory with a very strong policy like that. But we know we, know we don't know the metropole. And the, the knowledge about the metropole doesn't exist. We are very innocent about that. We know the city, the historical city. We know very well. But about the metropole is a new suburban substance. And we should imagine not one, but a lot, strategies. And I think it's not enough to speak about the complexity. We should speak about complexities. It's another word very open, also, it's a little bit, uh, uh, we could be a little bit nervous about that because where is the way? But the way, it weighs. And I would like to speak about the strategy of the Grand Paris, the context, and the, the, the story about this presentation is about Hotel Metropole. Hotel Metropole, is a, a kick name about this strategy, this policy. This image is for me the symbol about the relationship between the people and the metropole. And I think it's a very emotional image, but is a, for me, is a very essential image, how it's possible to build a metropole for everybody not only for some very nice people, for everybody. That is a question. And about Paris, it's not clear. First question, which area we should consider? It's the first question. The black point is Paris. When you say Paris, you are speaking about this point, but it's is very small, is 2.2 million inhabitants. But in fact, Paris is this uh, line, black line around, that is the territory of Paris. A lot of people move every day on this territory. And finally, we should consider 12 million inhabitants for Paris and the new name is 
le grand Paris, Greater Paris, that is the new deal to change the quality of the life, not only in Paris, but also in the national territory. And we would like to improve the quality of the life first. And also, we would like to reduce inequalities. And, and also, to develop increasing the activeness and competitiveness. And also in France, you know, when Paris change, France change. And the deal is very important for the, for the country. And we should have some place, places to think and develop this new vision about France and especially about the capital of France. And it's an experimental place, l'Atelier International du Grand Paris. This workshop is created by the President of the Republic, uh, Monsieur Sarkozy, Nicolas Sarkozy, and he developed this support and this input and the kickoff about the idea of Grand Paris and especially about this international workshop. And this structure, the goal is about the public interest. And we are working 10 teams at the beginning in this workshop, international workshop. Now we are 15 teams working and develop, and we develop some different research field. And I am thinking to, to, to make a, a project about a specific population in the metropole. Not about all population, not about the density, not about a global uh, approach, no. It's more specific, very specific. Because my question is, certainly existing a very special quality of the people coming, living, working in the metropole. Because it's a new body, it's a new urban body. Certainly existing some special situation, some special people. And I'm very excited by this idea about the specificity. Because in this kind of a specificity, we could find some fresh blood. And especially for people when they are arriving for a temporary time at one place. We evaluate more or less at 10% of the population of Grand Paris about this kind of status, status, if you want. Status maybe is not a, a good term, but finally I think it's a good term because status is the knowledge about this kind of people. And we try to evaluate the, the quality and, the, and the, the profile about these different uh, people. These people move, but not, on, not only the new inhabitants, different people move. You have some, re on the top, you have some, some research, uh, uh, foreign research uh, people arriving and working and studying in, the, in, in Paris. You have the, the self-made uh, men. You have some, uh, some people living in family. You have some uh, students. You have some divorce. New uh, wedding. And uh, also some, uh, some people staying for a court time in, in hospital. And uh, uh, some contract job, temporary job contract, and some people in jail, for example. Different situation for different social layers. But this kind of population 
should move in the metropole and should stay not for one day, like in a hotel, for two weeks, three weeks, two months, three months, four months. And this kind of uh, situation, I think, is totally metropolitan uh, uh, uses. And we imagine uh, this kind of pyramid, uh, and the, it's a metropolitan, it's a uh, people use the hotel metropole. It's a different step, but you have one person on each step, it's very democratic, and the idea is the hotel metropole has the ambition to give an answer to the needs of today's global mobility workers who transcend the social classes. And my idea is also to introduce a balance between the mobility. If you follow this kind of meetings, huge symposium, a lot of people speaking about mobility, mobility, density, mobility, mobility, density. Sorry, I am tired. I'm very tired. And I think sometimes it's necessary to stay in the same district to work, to live, to exchange. But if you want to stay in the same place, you should get, grasp some special facility. And after you move, you stay two months, after you leave, and you come back and now. And it's, it's true for the young people, but young generation, but also it's true for aged people. It's crazy in this kind of territory, the diameter is 60 kilometers, the, the Grand Paris. If the, the, the old people move each day because one of them is in, in the hospital, it's crazy. And we should think about the immobility. And the immobility also is a solution about the porosity. Because I think the porosity is a good term to develop a coherent social body. And where, where is a good question. Where is possible to introduce this kind of special facilities like a hotel metropole? Because if I consider uh, the, the, the administrative limit and the bureaucratic design about different cities in the, great, in the Grand Paris, it's absolutely inefficient. Doesn't work. We try to organize another kind of map. And this map, speaking about facilities, huge, important, and daily facilities for the people living in the metropole. And you could see on this place the distance between this different location of equipment. And after, we try to organize the evaluation about the time to move, 20 minutes, you could walk. And we overlapping between this kind of facility, equipment, and business area. And after, we develop also the idea about the proximity. And finally, we mixed with the public transportation, obviously, and the location of the station. And it's an experimentation. It's not absolutely perfect, but is a, a laboratory. And we develop more or less the concepts the concept about the meta-village. We say in Paris, Paris is a city of 100 villages. It's a very famous sentence. And we imagine for the metropole of Paris, 100 metropolitan villages. And we try to design some constellation like that with different points connecting by this kind of line. It's a new kind of territory. It's a territory where the people use, live, really, the metropolitan substance. 
is not a map. It's a real district where the people use today, tomorrow, after tomorrow, some facilities, some relationship, some real life. It is exactly the substance of the metropole. And with this kind of constellation, we try to organize the, the base, the our, our footprint, if you want, where we could introduce the hotel metropole. And the hotel metropole is a place where you are, you could live and work and so, and develop your personal life in the city. And we are working with another uh, size or maybe measure uh, about, the, the the, the, about the time. Because we are speaking about temporary and we are speaking about instability. And, and we would like to promote some different uh, program or uh, services for this kind of population. And the idea is not to dedicate one room for this function, another room for this function, like that. We could merge, switch. All is open. All could be work about this uh, situation. It's a, a more or less a joke between the logo on the left, on the right, sorry, the yellow logo is the logo of the, the public transportation, the metro of Paris, and the, in blue is the logo of Hotel Metropole. And also, the idea is to develop the proximity, the relationship, like a, a tensor in, in the city. And you show this kind of, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, representation about the DNA. And we could use that about function for the metropole. We are looking for the DNA of the metropole. That is the goal. It's very exciting, obviously, but it's very complex, you could see. And a lot of function under one roof is more or less the slogan about that. But the question is about the typology. We don't use the existing typology. We should change a little bit, not a lot, not to create a new modern movement. We would like just to consider the existing typology and transform this typology in a network, a building network. This example is a university in Seoul, a woman university in Seoul. And the building doesn't exist. I build a landscape, but underground this landscape, we have a building with a lot of connection between this empty space and pavilion and the campus. It is a public space, it is a valley, and it is a model about the network of this building. It's a very exciting situation because, in fact, the void is a real con physical connection between different functions. And we could maybe accept a coherent chaos with that. And to finish about case of studies, in different situations, for example, in a in the suburb, uh, uh, more or less, of the historical city, different situation, different constellation, some proposal of the network, and I would like to, I should go quickly, and i coming back in Paris about another kind of uh, situation. This building, this block, is in the center of Paris, is a post office, the main post office in Paris. The name of this building is La Poste du Louvre, you know, the traffic about later decreasing and disappear, more or less, with and uh, replaced by the email and the virtual connection. And this building is in this kind of constellation with different point and link in between. 
And the idea is to introduce in this kind of building some different fac facilities, some social fa facility, uh, a police, a small police station, some shops, hotel, uh, co-working space, so and different, uh, a very mixed use program. It is a poste du Louvre, and, and we transform, but also we keep the heritage, the architectural heritage, and also the industrial function. Historically, the post stay at the basement of the building, but we change the quality uh, of, the, of the different uh, um, uh, functions, and we could merge all in this building uh, for uh, different uh, objects. How can we imagine to develop this new typology in the metropole of tomorrow? Obviously, that is a question, but we have some solution, not one, but several solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to have a panel discussion at this point. The panelists are asked to kindly step back, uh, step onto the stage. We had uh, very interesting presentations, so we'd like to start our panel discussion. Time is limited. Uh, we have about uh, 30 minutes or so. So uh, perhaps uh, we could ask uh, some things to the panelists, and if there is time remaining, we'd like to entertain questions from the floor. As you can see, New York, London, New York, London, Paris, in each of these cities, there's an aspect uh, such that uh, they are big cities, but they have other uh, factors, uh, elements. And uh, each of the speakers have spoken from a completely different perspective. At the same time, uh, they are all correct. Uh, they were all very convincing and compelling. That probably means that with regard to cities, there are different approaches possible and there are different thinking, um, ways of thinking that can be applied and there are different uh, methods. And so uh, you can uh, apply uh, different ways and different approaches uh, in dealing with cities. This may be a difficult question. We've uh, heard about different cities and uh, different sp speakers have spoken. There's uh, Tokyo, including Tokyo, uh, there are four cities. So having heard about these cities, please think about the city that you're involved with and uh, what to do uh, going forward, the strategies for your own city, or maybe concepts and visions uh, for the future. Is there anything that you have uh, been inspired uh, about uh, hearing others speak? Uh, were there any uh, leads as to what you can do with your own city after having heard the other speakers? I'm sorry, this is a difficult question. But having heard others speak, uh, uh, do, you, do you agree with some of the points made? Uh, have, have some things inspired you? Uh, could we hear about this? Uh, could we start with uh, Professor Dominique Perra? You've heard about New York, London, and Tokyo. Uh, how, do you have any impressions uh, that you want to speak about, having heard the others speak? Uh, about Tokyo. Tokyo, it's um, when uh, you you show your di different project with some uh, very tall building. I I understand very well, but I I am not very happy. Uh, why? Because Tokyo for me is a is a fantastic city to control the big scale, the tall building 
and small building, very close. And this typology, this morphology, if you want, is a fantastic treasure. It's not so easy to combine mm. this kind of scale with a, with a very huge network, avenue, different, you know, the urban structure, very strong. Mm. And this is scale, very intimate. Mm. And I like this kind of situation. Mm. And, and, uh, and when, and it's, I, my, I don't know if it's a, a good dream, but for Paris, we have a, a, a lot of difficulties to introduce this mixity between tall building and small building. And, and, and I think it's, a, it's, it's very important to, 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 to protect this kind of approach because uh, I, am, I, I said, but I, I would like to repeat, the, the, the answer uh, is not one, is a lot of answers about metropole. We shouldn't think certainly about the global strategy, obviously, but is absolutely non-efficient if we don't work about the, the adaptation, the, 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 tr the transformation from the existing condition, mm -hmm. you know? And the existing condition is the, the root about a, um, a successful transformation. Without this relationship, it doesn't work. All is fake. And the people don't, li don't like it, and you introduce some trouble uh, in the social body. Thank you very much. In a certain sense, uh, Tokyo and Paris, uh, there are similarities, I believe. And that is uh, how I feel. Um, uh, Professor Perro talked about uh, the best, very distinctive features of Tokyo. Why do you think uh, Tokyo has these uh, peculiarities? What gave rise to these uh, uh, peculiarities? Uh, do you have any comments, uh, Professor Perro? Uh, I am about the par particularities of Tokyo, you, you, you ask. Uh, I, so for me, it's a, it's a huge area, three, 30, 34 million inhabitants. The bay of Tokyo, it's huge. And the, the, the question is, uh, is the relationship between uh, the, wo the void, the empty space, and the building itself. And I think in the metropole is a permanent question because the metropole is a, is a, a mixture between some piece of, of landscape and, uh, and some urban structure. It's totally another, an, an, another urban fabric. Mm -hmm. This urban fabric in the metropole is not pure. It's not like uh, the European city with a a very clear design in 2D. Now, the metropole is in 3D, and Tokyo is really in 3D. No discussion about that, I think. And, 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 but about the void, that is a question, because the void, the empty space in the metropole is a treasure, because the void is for everybody. The void is a, the, the, the essential condition, is not fundamental. The next Biennale will be about essential. Essential is a void, and the void in the city is a possibility for everybody to see something and to embrace something. Uh, next, Professor Chakravarti, please. I. I think all of us in different ways try to uh, discuss the idea of unpredictability. That, the, I mean, the last, sh the last slide that Peter showed, um, and I certainly, I, I love the section you showed of all of those different uses combined. You know, but I think what, what, what makes the void, as, as Dominique just referred to it, I, I think what's special about cities is the way in which uh, you can't actually plan what makes them great. 
What makes them great comes from all of the different collisions of unpredictability. Um, and this is, I think, the fundamental paradox of urban planning. That urban planning, and you know, obviously Jane Jacobs wrote a critique about this, there have been many critiques written about it. The, the, so I always laugh that, you know, so often a planner will say, well, all the tall buildings go over here and all the short buildings go over here as if we live our lives this way. So if you're tall, you only have tall friends. If you're short, you only have short friends. This isn't the way we live our lives. Um, when I was a student and I first came to Tokyo, uh, we were studying a project over in Maranochi and um, of course we had no money and so we always ate lunch in the little curry stands underneath the rail tracks because it was the only place we could afford to eat. Um, but it was wonderful and it was this complete unpredictability of finding those places mm -hmm in the heart of you know, one of the most expensive capitals in the world because somehow that unpredictability had woven itself into the city. And I think as we talk about all these strategies of intensification and densification, what I worry about is that we'll lose that sense of unpredictability and we will end up with a static city. And that, that's my major concern as, as we see cities grow in the way they are. So unpredictability to you know. That uh, unpredictability is not uh, pertaining to Tokyo alone, I believe. In Tokyo, what you just described, the surprises uh, that you may find. The, the, what kind of surprises would you find in New York? Could you give examples? Um, I, I think physically what we're finding in New York is that... Um, the, so, so the city has been kind of, uh, th there's a new form of, uh, I don't know how to say this here, homesteading, uh, where a lot of young people, people who are 20 something years old, who have a lot of tr trouble affording living life in New York, are finding completely different neighborhoods to live in. And I think they're, this combined with a lot of the, the you know, uh, Dominic section showed all the shared cars at the bottom. Well, they're, they're, they're sharing everything. They don't want to own anything. Uh, it, it's not about that for this generation. Mm -hmm. And this to me is very, because first of all, it, to do that, it requires the technology of the city. The city actually has a kind of hardware system built into it that allows us to share. Mm -hmm. And so add to that the technology that gives you the software to be able to say, I'll share in that apartment, I'll share that car. Uh, that to me is one of the big surprises that's happening in New York in what is a very commercial, materialistic, narcissistic place mm -hmm. that suddenly we're finding this generation that is using the city and its hardware in a completely different way. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bishop. It's the same question. <laughs> no, no, no. Just uh, talking about the first question. I, did. <laughs> but, uh, I think I'll probably start by agreeing with the point the Bishop made, that uh, when I was appointed to work for the Mayor of London, uh, the only guidance he gave me was uh, to say that my job was to think about London, what made London unique, and how we could make it better, uh, which I have to say is a fantastic job description from, from any mayor. Uh, that said, we spent an awful lot of time <clears throat> studying other cities. Uh, we had a kind of very competitive friendship with New York, uh, very interested in Paris, very interested in Tokyo, and what was happening in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Uh, and the thing that sort of struck us was that actually, uh, first of all, the problems we're dealing with are common. <clears throat> and secondly, most of our solutions are shared solutions. Uh, and the sort of third point was that, <clears throat> uh, speaking as a Londoner, uh, I think I have more in common with a New Yorker, a Parisian, or a citizen of Tokyo than I do with somebody living 150 miles outside my city in, in England. Uh, and therefore, this kind of common shared agenda between the cities was very, very important. Uh, I was very struck by listening to the three uh, or the four presentations uh, that actually what we were saying was largely the same thing with a slight 
nuance, a slight twist from the cultural context. Mm. And that was, that was really fascinating. Uh, and the kind of proposals for Tokyo against New York, Paris, and London. Uh, it, it's those slight differences which I thought was very, very interesting. And that's where we can probably learn lessons from each other. Uh, so, Professor Bishop, I understand you came to Tokyo for the first time. So it's, it's I think it's been several days. What's your impression of Tokyo so far? Uh, well, <laughs> in fact, I mean, first of all, it's been wonderful. I've had a fantastic 36 hours now in Tokyo. Uh, but it, it, I wouldn't like to, to judge or make sort of uh, too broad a set of generalizations. Uh, the first thing that struck me was walking around central Tokyo yesterday. I kept on thinking I was in New York. Uh, the, the similarities in terms of the structure of the cities, uh, the, the way in which they resolve scale, uh, the relationship between the sort of buildings and open spaces, the scale, uh, and the kind of proportions it was really quite uncanny. Uh, the, the, the difference, I think, was a cultural difference. And I was very, very interested at the kind of the very smooth, efficient way in which Tokyo functions. It was a fantastic asset for a city mm -hmm. to have against the kind of creative chaos mm -hmm. of New York and, to, and the complete chaos of London. So I think it was the cultural differences that, that really struck me. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that sort of struck me was, was actually, that generally speaking, I think in terms of the design of a lot of your, your new buildings, and an awful lot of central Tokyo, it is relatively new, so 25 years or so. Uh, I thought the, so the basic baseline was pretty good in terms of architectural design. Uh, I didn't see many things which I thought were really bad, uh, whereas walking around London, I see an awful lot of things which I think are really bad. So I was quite impressed by the kind of the, the general quality of the way in which the city functioned uh, and some of the interventions that have happened in the last sort of 25 years. Mm. Thank you. So we have uh, these three wonderful, prominent uh, speakers. So if there are any questions you'd like to ask of these uh, experts, I'd like to take the questions from the floor. Time is limited, so I think uh, I might uh, take two or three questions. So if you have a specific question to a specific speaker, please identify that, the target. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Please go ahead. Wonderful, insightful uh, talks, uh, all the three distinguished speakers. Uh, I'd like all you three to comment on Tokyo's uh, future plan on the Olympics. And as, as, as you know, Tokyo is uh, hosting Olympics in 2020, and as three most prominent cities in the world, London, New York, and Paris, what kind of advice uh, would you give to Tokyo to really build a sustainable Olympic strategy in terms of uh, urban planning and uh, city strategy? Thank you. That's precisely the question I wanted to ask. So uh, let's have the three speakers address that. What should Tokyo do? We have. Uh, six years, only six years, maybe. Uh, so, could you respond to the question, Dr. Perro? About Tokyo and uh, this uh, this uh, challenge uh, uh, with the Olympic Games, for me, is 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 very uh, is very interesting because, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Tokyo got all faci all sports facilities. Tokyo have need nothing about the sport infrastructure to 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 get to welcome the Olympic Games. It's an interesting situation. It's a little bit new, and uh, and I think it's a real chance to to switch a little bit the relationship between Olympic Games with a new district, with some new facilities, some new public transportation. Yes, but maybe with a new mentality. It's, it's a chance, for me the challenge for Tokyo 
is to introduce another urban mentality. The, the Olympic Games is for the city in the spirit, not, in the, in, not physically. Physically, you have a hall. You have a hotel, you have a hall. Where is the, no problem. The question is how this kind of metropole with this quality of about the development, about the urban development, could change with this kind of global, international, very preeminent event. I think it's very exciting. It's very new. Thank you. Please. Uh, you know, it, it's, I read a very interesting article about how uh, some people believe that the Olympics should only be held in one city and we shouldn't keep moving it around from city to city and we could do it in Athens and rebuild those horrible facilities that um, Peter showed in his slides. Um, <laughs> you know, I would just say that the Olympics is an opportunity to uh, catalyze what you don't have. So as a community, you can think about what is it you need that you wouldn't normally build, create, uh, that you could use the Olympics as a leverage for. So I, I don't know what that is. Maybe it's that the athlete's housing in the future becomes an incredible senior housing complex because of the aging society in Tokyo. Or, but I, I, I just think if you could think about what your largest urban problems are, that maybe the Olympics has the ability to push an agenda forward that you couldn't otherwise push just in the normal course of things. Yep. Six years ago, just after London won the, won the bid to host the Olympics, seven years ago, uh, I met two, uh, two people from the Dutch planning ministry who were charged with preparing Amsterdam's bid for the 2028 Olympics. Uh, I thought that was extraordinary, and they explained to me in this wonderfully logical Dutch way that you needed at least 16 years to prepare a bid to understand what the bid would do for you as a city. Uh, and I thought it was fantastic, absolutely brilliant as an idea. Uh, the big problem with the Olympics is you win it and you have six years. Uh, and I don't know what's happening in Tokyo, but in London we went, to, we went into shutdown mode. We spent two years refusing to acknowledge the legacy, although we'd bid on the basis of a legacy, because we were absolutely scared that we couldn't produce an Olympics in six years. Uh, I think the, the, the real message for Tokyo, or the real lesson I think from London, is first of all, you have to think about legacy in parallel. Despite the pressures, despite the panics, you have to have a long-term plan, and that has to be completely integrated in the same team, and you have to have to complete ownership. If that's not the case, you can be really subversive and plant people in the team, which is what we did in London, to try and distort the bid so we didn't close off, off the options. Uh, in terms of a long-term legacy, you know, we, we've thought about this in London, and I think that we'll produce something which I think will be quite good. I don't think it'll be as good as it could be, but I think it'll be quite good. Uh, but in many ways, I, I, the legacy is, is different, actually. There's a psychological legacy from London Games. I think London feels happier with itself. Uh, it feels slightly more cohesive. I think Londoners feel, still feel a sense of pride, and it has reinforced a view that London looks outwards to the world and not inwards. So I think that there are, there's a physical legacy, but I think the, the real interest for a city is to think about what the psychological legacy can be and how that changes the way citizens see and use their city. Thank you very much. Right now, as we move towards the 2020 the Olympic and the Paralympics Games, in 2012 there was the London Olympics. We often hear that up until the Olympics, everyone would do their best. But when the Olympic Games are over, uh, you would uh, actually decelerate your speed. Uh, you lose interest and you lose uh, the, the power. At the GCPI in 2012, London has become the number one city in the world, taking over New York. But then the 2013 and 2014, London is actually growing 
and actually make becoming more powerful. In the past, when the Olympic Games are over, you thought that the city will be in the decline. But why London is still flourishing, still growing? Uh, Professor Bishop, do you have any idea why this is still happening? Yes, the, I mean, one of the paradoxes about the Olympics is the city declines in terms of tourism, certainly in the year of the Olympics, uh, because actually people stay away. There's a perception the city will be so busy and so expensive. So it, it's no surprise that 2013, 2014, we're now taking the benefit in terms of growth off the, the back of the Olympics. Uh, I think that the, using the Olympics as a catalyst for change is important. Uh, winning the Olympics is a bit like making a really stupid public boast and then realizing you've got to do it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quite good because it does focus the, the minds of people to produce something. Um, and it's certainly, in the case of London, uh, we are very, very lucky because we hit a big property crash two years after winning the Olympics. Uh, and for about a year, the only building happening in London was the Olympics. So it was really important for the London economy. Uh, but actually, it also meant all the building contracts came in very, very cheap uh, and on very, very tight uh, timescales. So the best thing that could happen to Tokyo is a property crash around about 2017 mm. with a really quick recovery <laughs> driven by the Olympics. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for your suggestion. Now, we were talking about the uh, Olympic Games. So there is one question I would like to ask uh, to Professor Perot. So 2020 is Tokyo, but 2024, I understand that Paris is uh, trying to make a goal for that. Is it true? Is Paris challenging the 2024 Olympics? It's a noise. <laughs> we will see. And, uh, but um, uh, Paris also uh, certainly in this... Uh, uh, strategy about the Grand Paris. Mm -hmm. The Olympic Games could be uh, uh, a very good opportunity to organize the commitment uh, from different uh, mm -hmm. um, companies and, uh, and people to, to transform the city. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a good excuse. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my dream about, uh, personally, because I, I built uh, different buildings, important buildings for Olympic Games in Berlin and uh, in, uh, in Madrid, but <laughs> they, they, they lose the competition, but I built it. And, uh, and, uh, and my dream is about this, uh, this month, one month, and is to, to, to get a, a, a special experience about the urban uh, <clears throat> situation. And if I imagine a network in Tokyo between different locations of a sport building, it will be nice if during one month we could walk, we could go by, with bicycle uh, between each side. We, I think if in the same time we could, it's a, it's a good excuse again to, to develop another situation, like experimentation for everybody, for all population, not only economic. Economic is okay, but it's not enough for a good life. Thank you for your suggestion. Now, in this session, we have placed our target here to be 2025, because in five years' time, it is right around the corner. It's 20 years time, it will be too far. So about 15 years from now, 2025, if we could think about the future. That is the reason why I have come up with a target year of 2025. So now in the 10 years time, I'm not know whether we are competitors, but the top four major cities, I hope that in 10 years time, we'll still be the top four cities. But the top four cities, if we can compete with each other, to stimulate each other, to try to lead the whole world. I am hoping that we will still be in that position. And I'm sure everyone is hoping for that. So in a decade time, what about the other cities? For example, Professor Chakparati, maybe not New York, but Paris and London and Tokyo. What will happen for the three other cities? If you could give us uh, the, your view, your take. The same question for Dr. Bishop and Dr. Perot as well. 
And I believe that, that would take the time allotted. So this will be the last question. So please give us your comments about the, the three other cities. And lastly, what will happen in a decade of time of your own city? Would it be more prosperous or would the values be changing? And as was mentioned earlier, there are all sorts of people and group of people in the city. And who will be focused upon? And you need to combine all these different groups in a network. And there are many different challenges. So if you want to think about the future of your city in 10 years' time, so that will be the last point. So as I have mentioned in the order, if I could ask uh, Dr. Chakrabarti, first of all, please. Yes. Uh Thank you. Well, the biggest challenge we will face in New York is climate change. Without question, sea level rise is an, a major, major issue for a harbor city like ours uh, and like this one. Um, what I worry about in terms of New York is that relative to the other cities represented here, that uh, we, because of our national power structure or our lack of a national power structure, um, uh, will fall behind in terms of infrastructure, social housing, uh, you know, the things that I think many other cities are building uh, in, in, in a way that is advanced to how we are building it. And we will fall behind uh, if we don't do that. Uh, I, I have been absolutely amazed to see what London has done to itself in the last uh, two decades in terms of infrastructure creation and so forth. Um, you know, Tokyo, one of the world's great cities, I think, is, is continually uh, trying to understand how to kind of bring itself out of the 90s economy and into a kind of new way of thinking about itself and its new generations. And, and Par I mean, Paris, to me, the most interesting, uh, one of the most interesting things that Dominique spoke about was that, you know, 17% of Paris is Paris. The Paris we think about right, is only a fraction of greater Paris. And its big challenge, it seems to me, is this true understanding of the city as a whole and not just beautiful historic Paris. It's, it's a fascinating challenge. And uh, next, yeah, please. Yes, just so one uh, to, 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 to follow you about Paris because uh, the challenge for Paris is, is, is political. And uh, uh, recently, uh, the deputy chamber vote a, a new law to install a, a new territory for six million inhabitants. And uh, this law starting next year in 16. And uh, for Paris is a, is a new situation because with a, a new power, political power, to, to develop and control step by step, not, not like that, but step by step, and during maybe the next 10 days, 10 years, sorry, uh, it will be a, a very important uh, challenge for the city of Paris. And again, if we be successful about that, we change definitively the relationship between the capital and all the region and capital in the region in France. So please. Thank you very much. I think in terms of lessons for London from the other three cities. Uh, I think a really powerful lesson from Paris about the strategies for Paris to engage with this region uh, and recognizing that Paris cannot grow in isolation of the political yes, region. Uh, London isn't even talking about that at the moment. That is a real problem for us. Uh, in terms of New York, uh, I think sitting through the, the afternoon session looking at innovation and biotechnology, uh, just the sheer power of innovation that New York continually produces is the other lesson we, we really need to learn from London uh, about New York. And I think there's a real problem in London. Uh, we're being so successful in attracting inward investment because we're a safe financial investment place. Uh, things like housing is being priced out and those kind of really interesting little bits of city which are cheap, where you can form a toehold, you can... Uh, you can move in, you can live, you can start a business, you can experiment. Those are being priced out the market. And London's ability to innovate could well be completely suffocated by the property boom driven by foreign inward investment. Uh, Tokyo, uh, and, and I might be wrong on this, but I think that the, the thing that has impressed me is this kind of very, very long-term 
rational planning process, driven by an acceptance that actually some of it will be funded by an enlightened public sector investment through the government. Uh, and there will be public investment to move Tokyo forward. And that's another thing I, we need to learn from London, uh, learn in London, about how we sort of get the balance right between public sector and private sector. Thank you very much. Maybe I should also mention about Tokyo. In the past, Tokyo has learned from the three great cities, the three other great cities, for instance, in 1888, when Japan was modernizing, the very first uh, town planning was modeled after uh, the great uh, the Paris remodeling, renovation plan. And in 1958, when we were to come up with the metropolitan plan, the greater London plan in London was the model. And then we were growing economically, and we uh, were aiming to become New York, how to catch up with New York, how to learn the good things about New York. So we are very grateful to the three other great cities. Now, what will come going forward? In 10 years' time, maybe each city would uh, vie for different models from each other. Now, Tokyo, we have 35 million population. It is so populous, so we may be different from the other cities. But ultimately, what to do with the citizens living in the metropolis? I believe there are many common challenges. I hope that we will be good friends and good competitors going forward. I'm told that we should end. So thank you very much once again. Thank you very much. Ichikawa-sama, Peter Bishop-sama, Bishan Chakrava. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Ichikawa, Professor uh, Bishop, Professor Chakrabati, and Professor uh, Perro. Uh, thank you very much. Could we have a big round of applause uh, for the people up on stage?